my background is in stem cell biology, uh, and I got involved in next generation sequencing in, in 2010 when I was doing some of the early RNA-seq experiments looking at whole transcriptomes at the University of Cambridge. We were lucky to be just down the street from Embel EBI where they were doing some of the uh, earliest experiments in this field. So now I serve as the Chief Product Officer at Seven Bridges, um, where I'm privileged to lead a talented team of more than 50 engineers and scientists. So what do we do at Seven Bridges Genomics? Well, we're primarily a bioinformatics software company, but our real mission is to build self-improving systems for analyzing millions of genomes. And today I'd like to talk to you about two of our main projects. Um, the first is the Cancer Genomics Cloud, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, that we're building for the National Cancer Institute. And the second is our, is our research and development into a new paradigm for analyzing genomes called graph genomics. Um, and we're doing this as funded by the UK government through Genomics England in connection with the UK uh, 10, uh, 10K project. So first I'll talk to you a bit about the Cancer Genomics Cloud. This is what our current model looks like today. The Cancer Genomics, uh, the, the Cancer Genomics Atlas is a 2.5 petabyte data set, and it's collected at cancer centers uh, throughout the country and stored in one location. Currently, if you want to analyze those data, you need to copy it to your local, to your local servers. And then you apply your applications represented here by the small colored squares um, to those data in a local environment. So when you're talking about a 2.5 petabyte data set, we're talking about one month at best, more likely three months to even transfer that data. And when you look at these data centers um, that are contributing to the overhead costs at institutions, you're looking at government money being spent to duplicate data sets over and over, and researchers' time being wasted just waiting for the data to transfer. So the National Cancer Institute recognized this was a problem, um, and they announced a project to develop up to three genomics cancer cloud pilots for review by the community. And what they wanted to do was really not only break the inefficiencies, but democratize the research, allowing researchers who may not have access to those computational resources to access these data. And so we're proud to be one of the, th the three uh, institutions selected, along with Institute for Sem Systems Biology, as well as the Broad Institute. So with our Cancer Genomics Cloud Pilot, this is how we're going to approach the problem. So you have this fantastic resource. We're going to co-locate computational resources with the data storage, and we're going to store it in the cloud. We have it at Amazon Web Services is what we're based on currently. And then if you look at all the apps coming from different researchers at different institutions, there may be a fantastic algorithmic developer at an institution that perhaps doesn't have access to large amounts of data. What you need is a very robust yet lightweight system for porting these tools to the cloud, adapting them to the cloud uh, architecture so that they run efficiently and that they're interoperable. And so to this end, we started the common workflow language, and that's an open source project um, to develop standards around how we represent bioinformatic tools and pipelines. And we now, um, you can find it at GitHub, the common workflow language. Um, we now have collaborators at Arvados, at Galaxy, um, at multiple institutions contributing code and having discussions um, on a biweekly basis around how to best develop these tools. And it's going to be um, adopted by the Global Alliance as a standard uh, for how we represent these pipelines. And this is what we're going to use to adapt the tools to our cloud. Our own implementation of it uh, uses Docker containers, so we're talking about virtualized uh, machine images so that you can really have interoperability and be able to port the tools not only in our system but to a local infrastructure as well and other commodity cloud. And lastly, the researchers who can contribute their own data you need upload utilities to enable them to transfer and store that data alongside the public repositories and compute over them as a whole. So this is our Cancer Genomics Cloud. You can find more information about it at this URL. It's uh, sbgenomics.com, Cancer Genomics Cloud. And we're also on Twitter at, at @genomicscloud. 
Uh, in, the, in the coming months, we'll be accepting beta users. If you have dbGaP access, um, you'll be able to use that access directly on our cloud, so you'll be able to uh, conduct your research in this environment. Uh, we have funding set aside uh, to be able to provide actual resources to researchers to conduct uh, their, both their storage and computation needs with us. Um, and what we're really looking forward to doing is collaborating with the community to make sure um, that all the tools we build really fit the needs um, of the research community and are as useful as possible. And, and this is another kind of an, an illustration of why we think this effort is so important. So this is a paper by Gad Getz's group over at the Broad Institute that was from last year, um, published in Nature. This shows on the, on the x-axis the number of patients and on the y-axis the number of significant genes they were able to discover when they analyzed across 21 tumor types in the TCGA data set. And as you can see very clearly, the more patients you have, the more cancer genomes you sequence, the more significant genes you find. But what I think was really interesting about this study is when they break it down, uh, they, they break down the graph on the left to the one on the right, where you look at the number of significant genes and you just break that down by the frequency. And as you can see, with, with about 4,000 cancer genomes, you really only reach saturation point for genes that are found in over 20% of those patients. So when you look at the purple line, in contrast, we're just starting to see the uptick in, in, in our ability to even identify these variants that contribute to cancer that are rare. So, so this is where personalized medicine starts, not the things that affect one in five, but, but the really rare, rare variants. And we need lots of data to be able to find this, and it needs to be in one place. So this is how we've talked about, up until now, the first 2.5 petabytes. But what comes after that? Um, I'd like to put that number into context of where we are with the generation of next-generation next sequencing data. So first you have here, um, if you look at just the sale of sequencers, and, and on the left y-axis you'll see the number. We're, we're hitting 6,000 by um, about 26, uh, somewhere in 2017 uh, per annum sales. And if you look, there's a slight lag in actually the, the data generated, and this is in terabytes, you can see on the other y-axis here, the number of new, new, gen, new data generated by these sequencers each year. But when you look at the accumulation of that data, that data piling up upon itself, um, you can see that by 2018, we're going to reach about 2.5 exabytes of data. That's 1,000 times the size of the TCGA data set. So this is an internet scale problem. Um, and it's not something that we're going to be able to approach with our current tools. When you think about your current, your current pipeline for analyzing whole genome data sets, how long does it take to run 100 genomes, let alone when we're looking about 2.5 exabytes of data? And this is where we are right now. So we're really at the outset. So this is where our research and development effort on graph genomes comes in. Right now, when I sequence a genome, any new individual that gets sequenced, we already know about 97% 97 of the variants that we're going to find. We've already identified them, and they, sit in a, and they sit in a database. But we don't take them into account when we do the alignments, actually. What, what we do is we identify and we call those variants after mapping to the genome. We call them de novo every single time. We repeat our work. And what's more, the remaining 3% that 3% that we find, that's completely new to science. And instead of adding those back into the reference, we throw that data out. So we look at the result, we make a conclusion if we can, but we don't contribute that back to the, back to the reference itself. We don't learn from the data. We don't really apply internet-level approaches to our data using the current tools. And this is a representation of the genome that would allow us to overcome that, and we call this graph genomics. So the current representation really is, is just a linear. It's a straight line of A, T, Cs, and Gs, and then a separate database defining where and at what position you find differences. Here, on the other hand, you see three different types of mutations represented. So, so what would be the variant sequence uh, is in yellow, and I think you can see this a lot better. It looks clear up here in blue on the side panels, is the reference sequence. So an insertion looks like simply an alternate path through the reference. A SNP, again, is a fork where you have two different paths through the reference, and a deletion at the bottom, again, just another path. And so you can kind of think of the reference 
graph instead of being a straight line as, as really a path where we, where we diverge and come back together, where we share sequences. And what this allows us to do is, is to compress population diversity all into one representation instead of a single line with differences. It's all represented in one space. And this, this has advantages um, not only for, for storage, but also for our ability to map new reads, map new genomes. And this is data from our initial experiments that were, that were funded by the UK government to show this. Um, so when you, when you use uh, traditional um, alignments, so uh, a, a linear alignment, um, on the left you have uh, the total known variants, uh, and these are, in this case, just insertions um, in, a, in a gold standard reference data set. And when you align with linear techniques, our current models, you only detect a, a small subset of these, actually. And these are detections with two different um, variant callers. But if you align to the graph, using a graph representation of the genome and graph tools, you achieve much greater um, ability to map to that reference genome. And when you have more reads mapped to your genome, you're able to discover not only what we know, but also what we don't know. Increased coverage allows you to identify novel variants at a higher um, rate. So how does this look for cancer? I think it has a really special application to cancer because you're basically looking at evolution um, on, on the cellular level within a single individual. So if you take, for example, a reference to begin with, and then you sequence that individual and find the differences, you can then construct a personal reference. So it, it, it's a personal genome where, where you can include not only the entire population, but that 3% that's unique to that individual. And then when you go and sequence the primary tumor, you can sequence straight through those individual variations. So instead of align, uh, calling a tumor and a normal, aligning them to a reference, so finding the differences between each, and then find the differences between the differences, you align straight through the individual, and you find just the differences. And then when you can, you can do time series, for example, and you can look at the evolution of the tumor over time, Again, creating a tumor, a personal reference, a personal tumor reference, and then look at changes over time. So it allows you to identify driver mutations and construct uh, phylogenies within the tumor. So this is the direction that we're headed with cancer genomics. Um, we're building out the infrastructure to be able to really host these genomes, to collaboratively work on them, and we're building innovative technologies looking forward not just to the next year, but to the next 10 years and 20 years of cancer genomics research. So with that, I'd like to finish, and I'd like to acknowledge the entire Seven Bridges team. There's about 98 of us now. Um, uh, we're based across three offices. We opened up our London office with our uh, funding from Genomics England, and, our, and I'd like to acknowledge our other funding source, the National Cancer Institute. Thank you.